conversation. The idea of the conversation is that it's it's a slice of time. Right? I mean, it's really something that started a long time ago and hopefully will go on into the future. Um, so, I mean, you asked about a, a particular statement, which might be something that could wrap it all up. And I guess I'm a little adverse to wrapping it all up. That's kind of what my response was. David, I just had the pleasure of seeing your exhibition in Philadelphia. And, of course, the most potent thing about those paintings is the tension between these very, very declarative shapes and these very, very seductive surfaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I suppose you could say that's been true of your work since the get-go. Pretty much. I mean, I do think that, that in this body of work, first of all, the surface is much more uh, there, yeah. much more present. Much more um, layered also. And, yeah, yeah. Um, there's more layers underneath. Um, and I think that really makes a difference. Also, just changing to the panels, the panels, you know, canvas has give, and these panels have no give. So when things cut into them, yeah, exactly. Um, and you can size some things there. Yeah, but that incising is pretty much just part of that, that, that kind of final gesture that I make. I mean, as a result of the edge of the tool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, basically what I'm, what I'm doing, you know, when, to talk about layering for just a minute, uh, there's, there's a lot of layers of paint, but there's also at a certain point there's a layer of some kind of particles, whether it's sand particles or, um, you know, whatever they are, any kind of uh, abrasive particle. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a way for that surface to come up the way it comes up, but it also allows that color to come through. And it's very different, obviously, from, from a, a kind of glazing layering. But it has a similar effect in the sense that light comes yeah. back through. But you're getting these little striations with the scapes of mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. from underneath. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. there are the, the places that modulate the surface even more where things are pulled up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very subtle. I mean, you, you really have to put some time into to figure out what you're seeing. I think, well, this is, this is kind Which of I at the... Very me too. I mean, this, this is really at the, at the kind of root of the work, mm -hmm. you know. And, and it always makes me nervous to talk about the Instagram generation and the... Because they are so much about certain level of contemplation. Exactly. And that, of course, that's another reason they don't reproduce all that. Exactly. Uh, exactly. They digitally, because you're going to have a homogenized surface. Exactly. Exactly. But any photography will do it. Yeah. Um, it's true, and I, you know, there's no solution to that. You know, the solution is to get people to go out to and actually stand see them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. that that notion of um, what you make as a self-contained object has been there since the beginning. Yes, it has. It has. Um, Somehow it was just a natural evolution of working, you know. Um, it's interesting, I think, you know, at a certain point you can have a lot of, um, you know, thoughts in retrospect about the work. Um, and sometimes actually, I'm sure you're familiar with this kind of a phenomenon, you actually suddenly realize something that was obvious in the work and that maybe other people saw that you never saw. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's again, Makes me very pleased when that happens, you know. Uh, did you ever think of being a sculptor? I did, actually. I, you know, a lot of people have told me from the beginning that the work has very sculptural qualities. Um, well, particularly this, this last group where I find these fleeting three-dimensional illusions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Very, very potent. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, for a moment, you think you're looking at... A, three-dimensional, articulated volume, mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. warped surface of some kind, and then you look at the edge and you realize it isn't, and then more of mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to the glass pieces. Yeah. Because it's at a certain point in the work, I, I wanted to see an idea in three dimensions, and I wanted to see these volumes that I was making charcoal drawings of in three dimensions. One of my interests has always been this problem between parts and holes. And almost all of the works in this show are made up of parts. Some of those parts are more closely related to the other parts and some much less related. 
But in every case, something happens in the painting that points at that change. For instance, this is a two-panel painting. And if you get up close, you can see, actually, that edge. But I use this linear distinction to make it clear that that is, in fact, a break between one object and another object. I wanted to talk just a little bit about the object itself. Um, one of the things that has happened with the newer panels, the newer panels float out from the wall just a little bit. And so one thing they do is they make a color space behind the painting. Um, the fact that I paint on the front, on the edge, on the back, really emphasizes the fact that it's an object. Um, and then the other thing that happens is that the edges are not always consistent with the color that's there next to you on the front. So again, they, they emphasize the painting as an object, and they also clue into the viewer that the entire object is the experience, not just the front of the Surface of some kind, and then you look at the edge, and you realize it isn't, and they're more of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that brings us to the glass pieces. Yeah. Because at a certain point in the work, I... I wanted to see an idea in three dimensions, and I wanted to see these volumes that I was making charcoal drawings of in three dimensions. And um, what happened, uh, working with the Ross Art Studio up in Boston, uh, it, it, it exceeded all my expectations. Because, because I see the glass pieces as kind of a perfect combination of drawing and color. You know, There's no other structure there. It's just the cast glass, kind of naked. Um, and, and once I did that and I started to look at the color, I, I thought, oh my God, you know, because there's always this thing about, and, and some of my work has actually been about this, about, you know, how colors make sense or don't make sense together, mm -hmm. you know. And so I'm looking at a glass, a cast yellow uh, piece of sculpture, and in looking at it, I'm seeing you know, warm yellows, cold yellows, everything in between, you know, almost up to orange, almost over to green. I'm thinking, you know, why does this feel so right, so complete? Why doesn't it feel fractured in some way, you know? And with this body of work, I really wanted that kind of color. I wanted that sense of, yes, this is green, but then it's got all that other modulation in it. And of course, in some of them, you have these slight shifts Side to side, usually. Yeah, yeah side yeah, to side, yeah. Um, inside of the big configuration, as outside, which which enhances that mm -hmm. illusion of three dimensions. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's unnameable color. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're That's what I want. You know, it, yes, it's green, but it it's not a green I've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that, that that's definitely a, you know. I love to hear that. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the, the other part of this, too, is that once I started to think about the paintings, um, you know, after I made the glass pieces, um, the shapes became more eccentric because they're asymmetrical and because none, none of the sides align with the horizon of the floor or the vertical of the wall. Um, and That's a good thing. I, and I very deliberately yeah, did I not. And then, of course, you're very sneaky because sometimes they're warped hexagons and sometimes they're heptagons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I had a way of generating these shapes and, and uh, essentially it started out as generating points in a field. Mm -hmm. And then those points became places where you could build planes mm -hmm. and then you could build a volume. Um, Were there structural limitations to the glass pieces? Well, the biggest structural limitation is the weight of them. Yeah. And, you know, they're... They're, they're solid. They're solid. And, and I have actually talked to her about um, building one with an open center. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a job. It's a project. It's a big yeah. project. It's not cheap to do. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point, I hope we will do it. Uh, because I wanted to do a bigger one, and you couldn't... You know, the, the largest ones are this yeah. big. Which probably take three people to lift. It's, you know, really hairy to lift it yourself. You know, it's a terrible combination of fragile and heavy, you know. 
Uh, and that's probably why resin actually makes a lot of sense. I started out with resin. Have you tried resin? I've tried resin. The, the thing about resin, I mean, resin has enormous oh, possibilities. It's very toxic. It is toxic. And I cast some myself. And I, I, that is I, not smart. Yeah, I realize at a certain point I shouldn't be doing that. But the thing is the light and the color. Yeah. But, but it is true that, that um, with the resin, you can, the color you use to tint it is incredibly powerful. Yeah. And it can go opaque. So, so you have to get to that exact point where the light penetrates, but you still have dense color. Um, do you know the sculptor Willard Buckley? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Willard did, uh, when he was living in London, he did a number of resin pieces, uh -huh. and which were really were transformative to his work because uh -huh. he could see the interiors right. in a way that right. he had not when he was building these in wood. Interesting, yeah. But it took him, I don't know how many trials to find the color. To find that exactly color. exactly what you're using. Yeah. I, I kept finding that when I was doing it myself that I just got too dense. Because I couldn't believe that one eye drop would fill that <laughs> volume. You know. He had exactly the same yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but I, I, I would really like to, to revisit resin just because there's less of a size limitation. Yeah. Um, and it is, you know, moving these things around is, is a big deal. It is a um, big deal. But on the, uh, by the same token, I will say that, that glass is the best for the light. Yes. It is the best for the light. So, you know. I wish I could remember the name of a wonderful Italian artist in glass who died a couple of years ago, who's from a, a family with a long history with Murano. Oh, interesting. And um, James Barron did a beautiful show of her work at his gallery in Kent, uh -huh. where um, he, there, there tended to be just vertical pieces that changed very much if you looked at them diagonally or, uh -huh. or head on. Uh -huh. uh -huh. um, but they were small. They were I think that's that's one of the real limitations. But I, where I was going with that before was this idea that once I generated these shapes and saw them on the wall, I just kind of realized, on the wall in the orientation that I wanted, um, I realized that they did something really, really different in the space than a rectangular shape. Does. I mean, we don't, in a way, we don't see rectangle as a shape anymore. You know, It's so ubiquitous that it's also it's a convention. somewhere, whether we acknowledge it or not, it's a window. Yes, exactly. And making that window into an object um, is not always entirely successful. Well, the thing about the object, I, I've, I've been getting so much more involved with um, that objectness and, and painting around the edge and even painting on the back that, is starting that is to... Very, um, very obvious in uh, the exhibition at Locke's Gallery mm -hmm. uh, because the lighting was so good. The lighting was excellent uh, and you could really you see got, the glow. You got the glow from the back and mm -hmm. of course mm -hmm. as you moved around and you got these edges which were sometimes very complex. Yes, yes. And that little strip, I mean I, I'm really finding, you know, it's almost as though you're looking at a certain density and when you turn the corner it's that much denser. Yeah. You know? And, and, and I was amazed that I could split it in half and it was fine. You know, I first looked at the edges and started to think about this. I just thought, well, it's got to be one color. It's just, you know, what is it? It's an inch wide, you know. Well, when it but in fact, it does something extraordinary. It does something very different. And there's, there are a couple of things that it does. One is the sense that, that the painted surface, you know, if it stops on the edge at a certain color, it's as though the paint is that thick, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but if it, if it wraps around, it does a very different thing. And, and that's been an, uh, kind of wonderful for me because, because every edge is, situation is different. You know, I kind of thought I would be more consistent when I started doing it. But somehow, you know, the painting tells you, no, you can't do this. You can't but do you know, when you see them together, that becomes part of the thing you want to chase down. Mm -hmm. you know, you mm -hmm. go, just to, from one to another. From one to another. Mm -hmm. Just as when you're um, standing in front of one of the big paintings and you discover that sort of hairy patch over there. I thought it was just darker, but it's actually articulated. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. oh, that's not a drawing on top. That's something in there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, then, then the same thing happens when you start noticing the edges. Is, is that one the same? No, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And yeah. it, of course, that enhances the sense of it as an, the paintings as objects. Yes, exactly. And that, that's kind of where I was going with that. The, the, all of those things really um, highlight it as an object. And, and that was very important for me. To, to, you know, go all the way with that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and and, and the, what you were talking about with the tonal change from side to side, um, you know, I want that to be kind of fleeting. I don't want it to be like an illusionistic block, you know. Um, uh, my feeling is you're, you're never quite sure whether you've seen it or not. Exactly, exactly. And that's kind of, you know, I, 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 I kind of, there are a lot of things I play with where the tension is that way, mm -hmm. you know. Um, can kind of, you know, it's right on an edge. Uh, so anyway, yeah, so the, so the object thing really has turned out to be kind of much more than I thought of mm -hmm. a shaped surface, you no. know. Um, no. I, I mean, I've, I've been interested in your work for a long time, but I'm I think you've moved off to another level. Well, I actually, I mean, I do feel that way about this work, honestly. <laughs> I in all my humility. All the implications are there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but they, you've realized them all. You know? Yeah, I'm better, better, I think, yeah. 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 No, I, do, I think that. And I, I think, you know, to some extent, that's living a long time. <laughs> there have to be some compensation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think of uh, friends and people I knew who, uh, who died young. And you know, I felt really bad at the time. And then I think, but they didn't have any of the indignities of old age. So we were t one of the things we were talking about was surface, right? Yes. I mean, the, the, from this side, you kind of really get that. In fact, yeah. when, the, when the lights are out and it's only natural light and mm -hmm. you have that strong thing, and it really, it, it, it does something all over, but it does something, particular things in different places just out of uh, chance really. Something we didn't talk about, and this may not be the best example of it, is that many of the paintings have a, a very strong diagonal right. or a kind of vertical, and this has a bit of, it has the horizontals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which um, really set up, emphasize the irregularities. Of yes, the, exactly. Uh, I mean, there's that, that yeah. sense of like, you know, the body has this, you know, plumb line and, and horizontal thing, and it gives a place for the viewer to be because that's really in tension with the shape. Mm -hmm. You know, without these lines, you know, it's just floating. Yeah. Um, but I want a place for the viewer. I mean, that, that's always been a really big thing for me is that the notion that you can control everything a viewer mm -hmm. sees is crazy, you know. So I, 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 I let it open. But it also, it uh, I think, even subliminally, you're very aware of that and it yes, anchors yes. you. Yeah. It, yeah, it gives you an anchor, exactly. And I, you know, I had an interesting experience once at an opening where a guy came up to me and I didn't know him at all. And he said, so looks to me like you spend a lot of time on the water. I said, wow, you know, because I do, in fact. And I think this is a little bit of a part of that. Not that it was actually conscious. The know. way the horizon moves. Yeah, the, the sense that when, you, when, you're, when you're on the water, you're always trying to stay with that, whereas the, the boat, wherever you're on, is not staying with it. Yeah. So you're always, there's always that tension between mm -hmm. holding on to that and holding on to your balance. Center for Maine Contemporary Art, and I'm with David Rowe at his exhibition, The Shape of Things. Uh, this exhibition was intended to take place last summer, in the summer of 2020, in recognition of Maine's bicentennial year. David, as a native Mainer and uh, multi-generation um, Maine uh, family, um, we were conceiving of the show to celebrate the Maine connection and his many years working on Cushing's Island uh, in Casco Bay off of Portland, Maine. 
The show actually covers three decades of David's work, showing the progression of his shaped paintings over that time. It starts in 1990 with some of his early fresco works. It goes right up uh, to the present moment. Yeah, there are a couple of slightly old ones. There's the 76, ones from 76. But, but yeah, there was a big gap. Okay. So, um, but we were talking earlier about the space designed by Toshiko Mori, and um, everybody who comes into this space realizes it's a special space. Um, but we're actually seeing it completed. Uh, whereas Suzette, at a certain point, had a vision for it, and actually was maybe talking to Toshiko at that point, when you saw the show in 2014. Yes, so I actually was really introduced to David's work on this scale at his show at the Red Hour Gallery in 2014, where actually these two paintings were included in that exhibition. And I saw these large, giant shaped paintings that actually reminded me of sort of the lofting patterns that um, ship models were makers are doing and I really saw the connection to Maine as a sailor myself I was always looking at you know there's a sense of the horizon line in all of David's paintings and how the shapes move and sort of flow in relation to that horizon and just for me and that connection to Maine and being out on the water I just thought these paintings we have to show them in your home state I mean and we were in the process of designing the new CMCA at that time, um, really conceiving of an exhibition space that would be large enough on a scale to show paintings um, like this. Mm -hmm. And that truly, there was not another exhibition space in Maine at that time that could really handle uh, canvases or paintings um, work of this scale. So it was really that sort of you know marriage in my mind uh -huh. of these paintings and this space that we were designing um, that really comes to fruition in this yeah. current exhibition. I mean, I, I just I, I can't tell you how exciting to, to show in this space. I just think it is so perfect. Um, I could, couldn't be better. Well, and that's what I love here at CMCA. Our mission is to celebrate contemporary art in Maine. But what we like to do is show how that's really a broad body of work that artists that come here to Maine um, express that connection to the landscape in different ways. So even work like this that is completely abstract um, has that main connection in it. And, you know, um, so that those, those uh, influences of Maine are expressed in, di in different ways, but truly that through line of nature and that connection to the environment here in Maine is expressed in so many artists' work, whether it's completely abstract like David's or much more representational. There is that um, connection here in Maine to the sense of place. Um, the other is, I think that with David's work, there's also, you know, this, this uh, through line to uh, geometric abstraction to artists like Dorothea Rockburn and Kenneth Nolan. Nolan, another artist who ended up spending the last decade of his life here in Port Clyde, Maine. And many people may not, again, on the surface see a connection to Maine, but um, Ken was one who told me that it was really the light of Maine the atmosphere, if you can think about sort of those colors and the light and the luminosity and the fog and the environment and atmosphere of Maine that is expressed in some of his late paintings. So again, that, that sort of connection to mm -hmm. the larger history of American abstraction. Yeah, yeah, and it's really, it's one of those places, and uh, New Mexico is a little, somehow there's some quality in the light and the landscape that's inspiring just by itself. And it's kind of, it's big, it's hard to pin down, but, but Talking about the light is, is obviously central to it. And one of the things that, that surprises people is the warmth of the light. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, I, I spend time in New York City, and New York City has a beautiful silver to it. Maine has a very rich color to it, a very warm light. And, and I think people don't necessarily think that it's going to be a warm light. You know? Well, but, it's great that you even mentioned the light of Maine because, I mean, that is the thing, and that's this building, right? That was the element of this building that inspired the architect of Shiko Mori. This building faces due north, and so of course north light is the best light for both viewing art and making art, because it's always even, it's always, will 
it's just this wonderful ambient light. And you can see in the space that we're in that it's, you know, north natural light floods the building, floods the room. And so seeing paintings like this with the chromatic value that David's paintings have is, you know, this is this is the peak sort of viewing experience is to see these works in this setting with this natural north main light that comes in. Um, it just really makes the work spark. It would be hard to find a space this good. I'm sorry, you know, I've been missed. Um, so I couldn't be happier.